Welcome everyone on this second Sunday after Pentecost and happy Father's Day to the fathers and the father figures in our lives. All of those who are watching online or sitting in the pews are part of this congregation and part of the body of Christ. For those who may be joining us for the first time for worship, I'm Reverend Fraser Williamson, the minister here at St. Paul's United Church in Golden Valley, and I'm also the minister of St. Andrew's United Church in Port Loyne. Today we have a joint service here at St. Paul's so that I can attend the general council meeting at noon, um, and that is held online. We ask you thanks to Christopher Moore for the wonderful music. Some of you, some of you have heard it already and as well as the singers on the tracks. And, and our middle hymn, there's been no recording for it yet, so I hope all the lovely voices are going to be a part of that middle hymn. <laughs> Let us take a moment to acknowledge the territory we're on. For thousands of years, indigenous people have lived in gratitude and reciprocity on this land and its waters. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, and we thankfully acknowledge their teachings and their ongoing protection of the land and water. And our Christ candle lighting is responsive, so please look in the bulletins. In a time of change and confusion, the source of unwavering light. In a time of transition and change, we need a light to show us the way. May the light of Christ be this light for every one of us. May it shine in our hearts all of our days. And now our call to worship. We come as children of God. We come unsure where to seek God's presence. The wind blows. But God is not in the wind. The earth quakes. But God is not in the earthquake. The fire burns. But God is not in the flame. There is nothing but utter silence. Is there in, the in silence we wait for God. God is with us now. I invite you to turn to the, actually, um, we will actually sing our first hymn, 
number 286, if you will trust in God to guide you. For the opening prayer, let us pray together. Understanding God, thank you for listening to us when we gripe and complain. Thank you for watching over us when we stumble or lose our way. Help us to recognize that you are our bread and butter. You are our daily bread that nourishes our lives and spirits. You are your evening meal and the substance with which our wilderness journey is sustained. Feed us with your care and comfort us with your peace. Fill us with your presence and shape us for your purpose. In love and thanksgiving, we proclaim that you are our loving God. Hallelujah. Amen. The God of the oppressed hunts evil as a lioness stalks prey, so that sin cannot hide in high or low places. But the Holy One also forgives all who repent. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. We long for you, O God, discouraged by our flagging efforts. We are afraid of what the future may bring. We separate ourselves from our siblings in Christ because they are different from us. When we pray, we don't always feel that you hear us. Be present with us. Heal the places of our doubt, despair, and alienation. Cure us from hatred and discrimination. Cast out all that keeps us from you and one another. Amen. Each day, God's love is steadfast. Each night, God's peace abides in us. We are all part of the one family in Christ Jesus, and we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Well, young at heart time, I mentioned that it was Father's Day, so I thought, why don't we just dedicate some of that time to that? And... Um, what I'd like to ask is, all of us have fathers, and if you'd like to share the name of your father, I'd like, if you'd like to share, share the name, and 
maybe one thing you liked doing with your father or one good memory? My dad said, once Reginald Johnson Fleming. Reginald Johnson Fleming, okay. He worked in the lumber camp and he was a teamster and he was known as a very good teamster to take, take care of his horses. Oh. And he was a reader, and I'm a reader too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Who's next, or who'd like to share next? Me. Sharon. Yeah. My father's name was Morris William Murphy. He was, um, he did lots of things. He was a trapper, he was a logger, um, manual labor mostly. And um, he had lots of other interests as well. One of the things I loved doing with him the most probably was playing cards. Cindy. My dad's name was Bernard Joseph Holmes. He worked at a Gleason's as a logger. And also he ran a farm. And what I remember the most is I was small. My dad had two horses and they were Dick and Barney. <laughs> <laughs> and the one did not matter. He would steal dad's hat and run with it. And <laughs> of course us kids had to go and find the hat. Maybe my brothers did it the most, but once in a while I got sent to something. Anybody else would like to? My dad's name is, uh, and Phil Dick's name is David Tony, and that's his, uh, his what we call him. He, uh, memories of, uh, we had a cottage. Game player, and what I remember most really was if he wanted something, he got another job, and he was like, "How do you pay for the boat or whatever?" He wanted. Mm -hmm. He got another job. It was sort of like just a side job. Yeah. Would he only do it just for until he got the boat, or pretty much? You, pretty yeah. much, yeah. 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 And boat sounds important, so that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Anybody else? My dad's name was Gilbert Fifield Fry, and somehow or other our family seemed to manage to pass that name down to the next generation. And I'm not sure whether they're related to grandchildren who keep keep that name or not, but we've got it anyway. But he uh, loved the outdoors, and I used to like picking berries, even painting was fun. He always had a way of making everything an adventure. And uh, yeah, I do miss him because he always kept things happy and nothing was impossible and nothing was terrible when, when he was around. He made everything okay. And I Anybody else before I share? I guess I will. And it's, I, I really like that everybody chose the formal names. So here I go. John Kenneth Lundy Williamson and went as Ken. And it's actually quite interesting. Today would have been his 74th birthday. Um, he was a farmer and worked real hard and actually did all the farm work himself with the help of other farmers when his dad died when he was 12. So he's always been a farmer. Um, he won in 1983 a Canadian Curling Championship. And I have the ring right here that is that was his that the curling club gave him for winning it. And that's one thing that we liked to do together was uh, was playing curling. And we know curling there's a lot of yelling to sweep and sort of sometimes disagreements on what the shot should be. But uh, I I do remember it 
really well and uh, just the fun times with that. And um, I always, when I still play curling, I, I'm like, there's a good shot or strategy. And, I, and when I played when he wasn't there, I'd phone my dad and say, look what I did. And I, because I did something really daring, I'll phone dad. Well, that happens now, I can't phone dad, but I believe that he's, he's watching those good shots and the good strategies still. So your fathers and your father's figures, um, thank you for those that shared and, uh, and God is present in each one of them. Let's move now to the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. You God, light up our lives when we are open to your presence and your word. You provide each one of us with the power and enthusiasm to carry on. We are here to open ourselves to your presence and to be guided by your truth. We are thankful that we are not alone, no matter what we face, this day and always. Amen. And we have coming up, um, the we have uh, Connie at the last minute has uh, agreed to read. And there are some hard ones in, so I'm sort of glad it isn't Cindy. <laughs> Response of Psalm is Psalm 4243. It's found voice united on page 768, and we're doing refrain to it. So longs my soul for you, O oh God. My, my soul thirsts for you, the source of my life. When shall I come and behold your face? Day and night I taste only tears, while they steadily belittle me, saying, Where is your God? But I remember, though my soul is distressed, how I went with the crowds to the house of God. Our voice is joyful and filled with praise, a multitude keeping festival. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. My soul is overwhelmed within me. Therefore, I remember you in this land of Jordan, in Hermon, and on Mount Mizar. Like a turbulent roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and currents wash over me. With loving kindness you bless my days, and by night your song is with me, a prayer to you, giver of mine. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go like a mourner because my foes oppress me? I am like one of those bones that are broken to pieces through the taunting of my enemies. They steadily belittle me, saying, Where is your God? I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against faithless ones. Save me from those who are deceitful and unjust. You are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go like a mourner because my foes oppress me? O oh, send your light and your truth to lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. And then I will go to the altar of God. To God, my exceeding joy, I will praise you with the heart, O God, my God. I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy. 
Our reading this morning is from 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 15. Ahab told Jezebel that Elijah had all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah, saying, So may the God do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary room tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of the food, 40 days and 40 nights, to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire the sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. There came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Elijah was a very controversial character. He was called by God to be a prophet. And we, what we've learned in the last few weeks is that the word prophet means proclaiming the word of God. It is in sharing the word of God that Elijah gets into trouble and he fears for his life. When he was called to share God's word, he expected everything to go smoothly. When it did not, he asked, where is God? Elijah felt God's call to be a prophet, and in a very short period of time, he did many great things. First, in the time of drought, in faith, he used the last portion of water available in the land and said that God would end the drought, and the drought ended. He also brought a widow's son back to life. With God's help, Elijah, in addition to these miraculous acts, 
along with other prophets, brought in religious reforms. These reforms were not well received, and a lot of the prophets were killed. And one of the reforms was the presence of priests of Baal, and Elijah ordered many to be killed. Elijah, in his reforms, was stating that the only, only the word of God be shared, not and not have the presence of other gods. Many did not take the news of the slaying of the priests of Baal well. One of the individuals who took offense to this act was Jezebel, who was the queen. She was also angry because she also worshipped Baal, and that she, because of that, she wanted Elijah killed. When Elijah got word of this, he was distraught. He had done everything that God had called him to do, but he faced opposition. He had felt God had put him in a bad situation. He felt that he did something wrong and he fled for his life. He began to question his call and he believed that God wanted him to die. That was the introduction. Now we come to the moment where the scripture comes in. After the threat was issued by Jezebel, it says in verse 3 that he was afraid and he got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked if he might die. It then says that he slept under that tree. In his sleep, he was touched by an angel who told him to get up and eat. There, his head, where his head was laying, was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. The angel told him to eat as he would be going on a long journey. He then went 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness. It says, then he got to Horeb, which is more famously known as Sinai, the site in which Moses encountered the presence of God. He spent time in a cave there, and the word of God asked him why he was there. Elijah shared his fear. He shared that he went there because he felt that this was the place he could meet God. Elijah was expecting to get a moment that Moses had and the people in the wilderness had. He had known that God's presence was, presence was in the wind, like when the Red Sea was parted, and that God was present in fires and great loud acts. He was instructed by the word of God to get out of the cave because the Lord would pass by. He waited inside. As the scripture says, now there is a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. Things shook, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, not like the burning bush. And after the fire, the sound of sheer silence. Elijah was surprised at the silence. He was told that God was passing by and he expected to hear God call him out, calling him out from the wind, from the fire and the earthquake. In the silence, he wondered in fear if he had missed the word of God. He went out to see what happened. Then as he walked out 
In the silence, God spoke to him, and God's presence was revealed. God asked in a quiet voice what he was doing there. Elijah said that he was fearing for his life for the, uh, for the many of, because of the many of her prophets that were killed, and he said that he was all alone. After some time, God then instructed him to go to Damascus and appoint a new king for not just the one kingdom in there, but several kingdoms in the area. And later in the scripture, it says there will be, which is an affirmation, it says there will be 7,000 new prophets to preach the word with him. And that God also said that Elijah will anoint Elisha as prophet in his place. Even though it was a tough time for Elijah, God was with him in the wilderness and God guided him in his mission. God sent the angel to feed him. In the wilderness, Elijah was not alone. In his mission, Elijah was not alone. The scripture in the life of Elijah is very similar to the life of Jesus. Jesus was a controversial character. He spoke the word of God and he was the word. He spoke up for the oppressed and challenged those in authority. Like Elijah, he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and God guided him. Jesus brought people back to life. His actions were criticized by those who had authority and they wanted to take his life. Like Elijah, even Jesus doubted and asked where God was when he yelled, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? Like Elijah going into the cave, Jesus went into a cave. It was a tomb for his burial. And at the moment of his death, the ground shook, but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was silence. The word of God was made quiet. In the silence of Easter morning, like Elijah walking out of the cave in silence, Jesus walked out of the tomb. There is no fanfare as he walked out, just a gentle encounter with Mary. It is in the silence that God's greatest act was revealed, the granting of eternal life through the resurrection of Jesus. Like Elijah and Jesus, there are controversial leaders in the church. This weekend, the General, of Count, General Council of the United Church of Canada is meeting. There are many proposals that will be voted on in the summer session. And one of the most controversial of these are the proposals concerning Israel and Palestine. For many years, these proposals have been an issue of conflict. There are people on both sides, even in the United Church, on the issue. The United Church of Canada has made controversial decisions in the past, such as the welcoming of the LGBT community and the ordination of individuals who are part of that community. In all these new proposals that came forward, those raising them wondered where God was in the face of opposition. They faced opposition 
when they were doing what the Spirit has called them to do, what God has called them to do. Decisions around COVID-19 became controversial. They were so controversial that we saw a convoy head to Ottawa. Many were looking to replace the leadership because they did not like the restrictions. And these crowds that gathered were a security threat not only for our nation's leaders, but also for those, and I have many friends who live in Ottawa. As we encountered COVID-19 as a church, there were several changes made. Many were not happy with the changes that came in. Worship style in all churches changed, and many were angry about these changes. Many people were demanding that worship be the way it was before. Like Elijah and many going to Horeb, many go to church to hear the word of God. When looking at the attendance of many churches now, many ask, where is God? Why is God not bringing lots of people into the building? Many expect that God is alive when there are several people in the pews and several voices singing the hymns and you could hear it down the street. Even though we do not hear the many voices and, and singing and praying, God is still here. God is speaking in the silence. We no longer hear God in the noise. We hear God in the silence. And in the silence, the small voice of God is calling us to go out into the world and make changes. God is calling us to be controversial. God is calling us to make changes in the world. In making these changes, the road and the journey will be difficult. But in making these changes, we are assured like Elijah that God will be with us to guide us and sustain us. Thanks be to God. Amen. And the next hymn is, and we're going to be recording it, 652, Be Still My Soul. Still my soul, your 
to dedicate the offering and we will dedicate it by singing number 543 we give thee but thine own verse 1. <laughs> to be angels in the lives of another. Inspire us to seek the needs of our community and to act that we might lessen the struggle and the challenges for each other. Encourage us to use the ways you bless our lives that we might be a blessing for others. Amen. And now the minute for mission and experiment. <coughs> Now I can satisfy the needs of my family and supply the market. Habtamu and his family live in Ethiopia, Ethiopia where Habtamu farms the land he inherited from his father. Unfortunately, when the land was passed on to him, it wasn't fertile. Teams of oxen used for agriculture had eroded the soil and the harsh sunlight meant that anything planted in it died. Thanks to a conservation agriculture program supported by the Canadian Food Grains Bank, a mission and service partner, Habtana and his family learned farming techniques that reduce soil erosion, improve soil fertility, and increase productivity. For example, they are using crop byproducts as a cover for their soil, preventing it from being exposed to sunlight and rainwater. The impact is incredible. Earlier, we were hungry and the land was infertile, but now for the last eight years, we have been harvesting a good crop. I am happy we are trying to alleviate our problem, change our lives, and feed our children, explains Hatima's wife while he proudly shows a barn full of grain. Before, we only had one or two grain stalks. I used to feed my children with maize I bought at the market, but now I can satisfy the needs of my family and supply the market, Captain says. Your generosity through mission and service supports the Canadian Food Grains Bank. This is one of the many ways that your gifts help to end hunger. I would really like to express my deepest gratitude for giving us knowledge and insights. I am really grateful to you for all the kindness you have shown me, Captain says. For uh, reading that, Sharon, and uh, and yes, God does provide food. So it just worked along there, along with the, with the theme today. Now for mission and work of the church. Every Monday here is uh, at seven o'clock, bid your here at St. Paul's, cost us $3. And we have coming this week here at St. Paul's, the St. Paul's elders at 11 o'clock following the ladies coffee hour. And next, the week after that, June 28th at 11 a.m. is St. Paul Stewards at the, um, at, here at St. Paul's after Ladies Coffee Hour. And Sunday, July 3rd is Canada Day Weekend Worship with Holy Communion. And uh, my last Sunday is July 17th. And um, following that on Tuesday, July 19th at 11 a.m. is St. Andrew's Council, and that's only if the region has appointed a pastoral charge supervisor. And we have Sunday, July 24th is worship led by John Sheridan, LLWL, and Sunday, July 31st, worship, worship led by Reverend Kathleen McCallum. Any other announcements? Let us now take a moment for prayer. Holy God of earth and sky, 
In your presence, mountains quake, flames tremble, and the winds roar, hallelujah. We pray for the coming of your kingdom. Let the earth be made whole and new. Let the sky be made clean and refreshed. May all who dwell in heaven and throughout the world be joined in giving you praise. We pray for the nations and people of the world. Let us receive your reign with glad gladness. Grant world leaders wisdom and humility that they may guide your flocks in ways that make for peace. Give us ears to attend to the voices of poets and prophets through, your, through whom your spirit speaks. We pray for the most vulnerable, for creatures threatened with extinction. We pray for those of the human family who are poor, homeless, or refugees. We pray for victims of political or domestic violence. We pray for those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. And now, in silence, we pray for the concerns that are dear to our hearts. Grant us compassionate hearts, inspired minds, and wills resolved to care for our neighbors with the love of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 651, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
in the world. You will face opposition. There will be times when you will be afraid. But know that God is with you in times of silence, calling you to come out and share God's love. As you go sharing that love, may God bless you and keep you May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.